Good afternoon. I'm Karen Pearson and I chair FIT Sustainability Council. And it is my great pleasure to be joined today by um, two wonderful FIT community members. Mimi Prober, who is an FIT alum. She graduated in 2012 with a degree in fashion design and worked specifically on special occasion and couture work with a minor in the history of art. Also joined by Professor Suzanne Getz, who's an associate professor in the um, textile and surface department and really a leader in intersectional work where we look at how science and design and working with craft and artisans really impacts the future and helps us create pathways that are much more sustainable in nature. And Mimi, for those of you who don't know, her work after leaving FIT has been celebrated by many, and quite frankly, right now, the most exciting piece is to note that you can view her work at the Metropolitan Museum. And that exhibit is actually, I can read it correctly, will be there through September. So please make sure after our conversation, you actually take a second to look at both of her work, but go and visit Mimi's work. And during today's conversation, we're really going to look at how Mimi's work has intersected within the pillars of sustainability and use that to inform her process and the mindfulness of it. And in the end, we're going to shift this to a focus on a discussion that both Mimi and Suzanne have had extensive work in, which is the process of natural dyeing and doing it using a variety of materials, including food waste, which is something that Mimi has most recently been working on. So, without much more ado, it's my great pleasure to start this conversation off and give Mimi a chance to start and talk a little bit about her story and journey from studying fashion design at FIT to now being a leading designer who is creating collections, getting those roles, she has her work displayed in a variety of different venues and different capacities. So I'm going to pass it to Mimi and let her talk a little bit about that story before we talk more specifically about dying. Mimi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And it's a pleasure to always be included in a part of FIT. Um, FIT is still very close to my heart. Um, so uh, as was mentioned, I graduated in 2012 and I actually kind of started exploring uh, my philosophy of integrating antique textiles to establish a sustainable future um, through my time at FIT, through my thesis collection. Um, so basically, um, I used antique textiles um, from the 18th to early 20th century, and that's how I established my philosophy. Everything was very much hand draped, hand embroidered. Um, it was about sharing uh, the textile story and all of those narratives, as well as I also explored natural dye during that time. And um, that is kind of how my brand um, has slowly grown and started. Um, I am still doing that kind of work today. Um, with our work today, we do uh, also work um, internationally and locally with artisans around the world, um, whether it's creating our custom textiles with fiber farms, um, as well as um, employing all of the handcraft techniques such as lace making, um, hand weaving, hand spinning, um, using all organic natural textiles, as well as still the antique textiles, which are um, a pillar of our work. And then, of course, um, natural dyeing. So natural dyeing um, it has always been a signature um, of our brand. Everything that we do um, is only naturally dyed um, with botanicals and our signature watercolor techniques um, and our uh, brand in general is based on four sustainability pillars, which is preservation, farm to fiber, ethical production, as well as community engagement. So, <laughs> great. I mean, maybe that sounds fantastic. And I would love to see a few examples, maybe, of the processes you're working with to lead everybody in the different kinds of design you work with and what those look like. Sure. I mean, so I guess I'll start with like preservation, um, which is our, our first sustainability pillar. So, again, going back uh, to my work at FIT, um, we use antique textiles and share those textile narratives um, through our design. So, um, we integrate these antique textiles um, through our zero waste techniques. Uh, we, it is, I will say it is very important to me um, that we preserve uh, these 
these uh, processes, um, as well as um, be mindful of what we're using. So, um, so that's carried on into uh, the handwork that we do. We work with, again, artisans from around the world. Um, one of our most recent collaborations is with a wonderful women's lace guild um, in Kolam, India. So we work um, solely with them to create handmade lace. So they work um, still with the techniques of handmade lace, and it's really, really exciting and something that I think needs to be preserved and cherished. There's all of these handworks um, that really have the ability to disappear. Um, so we do all of these things very mindfully, um, slowly. It's all, you know, very, very, uh, very much part of community. Um, and then with the farm to fiber, we create uh, custom textiles with uh, local fiber farms um, as well as mills. Um, so we've worked with um, Vicuña, uh, Paco Vicuña, as well as um, Cormo Wools, and um, we work with upstate New York farms uh, that are wind and solar power based. And we've uh, created these custom textiles where they have actually the uh, antique lace or textiles embedded within our our pieces. Um, so that's signature to ours. And really, it's really about textile creation at the end of the day, um, as well, again, um, talking about um, community and artisanal work. And then um, with the natural dye processes, um, so we use uh, fresh and discarded flowers. So um, again, I know this conversation is really going to be a lot about the natural dye techniques. Um, I, I look at flowers in a very a unique way. Um, I actually love uh, flowers that are, you know, at its end of life. Um, you can reuse those in your natural dye process. Um, so we do a lot of what I call um, watercolor botanical hand painting, and it's kind of bundling those flowers, steaming them, or um, transferring them into our collections. Each season, we have a new natural dye process. Um, that we integrate new natural colorways. We've used also food waste, which um, includes avocado, um, as well as in our spring collection, we've done imprints with um, dahlia, as well as eucalyptus, and then um, little imprints of onion skin, along with other botanicals. Um, so really, it's a full circle process, and each little piece, um, we try to share that story and work with um, all of the people that um, inspire us and hopefully will bring this industry forward uh, for the next generation, um, really with the idea to reshape and rethink the way we create and um, how we do business in our industry. That is fascinating. I um, put two different notes of the places I would love for you to spend a little bit more time talking about how you work on these traditional methods that more relate to the textile creation. So not necessarily the dyeing, but more the weaving um, and the actual creation of the garments. I know we'll talk much more about color and that aspect of design in a bit. Um, but you know, that component along with the target of making items zero waste, I think would be a really interesting thing just to spend a little bit more time on here. Sure. Um, so, so yeah, so, uh, so. All of our textiles are custom made. Um, we actually um, create each textile, um, whether it's with the antique textiles to create our one of a kind textiles or um, like patchworking it together, hand embroidery or um, working with artisans again um, around the world um, who are doing beautiful work um, and hand weaving, hand spinning, hand knitting, all of those crafts that um, really are at risk um, to uh, go extinct. Um, it's really important for me to support them in all the ways that we can. Um, so with our custom textile creation, um, not only are we using the antique textiles in our atelier, um, we do the, um, the custom textiles as well with the farms, um, or working with these artisans who are hand weaving and hand spinning um, organic uh, silk, um, organic cottons, creating, um, you know, your, your base textile that we then natural dye, um, or, um, we've also recently expanded into a lot of hand knitting, um, and we work with, um, a wonderful, uh, family group, um, that is also near and dear to my heart, uh, in, um, Ladakh area. So, um, so they are, uh, 
the hand knitting it, it goes from it goes from again from the farm to the, the fiber but it's not really a farm so karnak nomads um source the pashmina that we work with um it's again full circle um in that uh the pashmina cashmere is then hand spun um by uh these family artisans in the dock and they're all they're all interconnected uh they're all related and um it's just the most beautiful fiber and i think something other than just like supporting the process you really feel the difference in the textiles as well um so i know like um i know sometimes there's like questions of like you know what's vegan or you know should you use wool and i think it's important if we're going to talk about a wool in general and in these in these um these farms and mills that um if it doesn't hurt the animal if the people are caring for them. So it's really, really important to know your sources, to visit your sources if you can, to establish that community, that connection, um, because there is so many wonderful things happening um, with, with these farms and these animals that we need to support. Um, so I think that's important to say. Uh, don't, to not just cancel out, you know, a, a textile because you've heard small scale people doing brilliant work and preserving these these crafts and uh the caring for the animals i it's the whole whole process that i could go on forever about but um maybe following up on that i'm curious how you make the connections with the artisans you work with yeah so uh so i've been very lucky in that um it's kind of been like friends who are also working in different spaces like uh that introduced me to the wonderful knitters that we've worked with um the lace making i actually saw um i i i don't remember where but um it was very hard to get a hold of them and it was wonderful because this friend who i'm working with in the knitting um uh, they don't speak English, so it turned into me uh, establishing a, a friendship with um, uh, uh, someone else to be able to translate. And then we've been able to communicate through them. Um, but as far as like, you know, the local farms and all of those things, I, uh, you know, I, I go upstate and visit and uh, actually create uh, with with these farms. Um, we work with um, for the Pak of Acuna, which is a uh, I know you, I know you're familiar with it because um, I was working the last time um, we connected on that. Um, but this wonderful um, family-run sustainable farm uh, in Missouri, and um, they. Uh, they take care of those rare camelid breeds. If you're not familiar with the Paco Vicuña, it's a mix between an alpaca and a vicuña. Um, so it really has some of the softest, uh, most exclusive fiber in the world. And just again, caring, watching them care for um for these animals, you'll see like their grandchildren care for them, and you can just like I mean, they're not they're not pets, but they are, you know, they're part of the family. I mean, it's 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 such a special thing to see when people really, really care um, for for that. But really, just like you know, as much research as possible and making those connections with your community um, to to try to see what is possible and how you can support them. I think that's really, um, you know, the bottom line in my work is I'm really trying to um, obviously create you know beautiful clothing. But it's really beyond that. It's really about supporting um, these businesses um, and being able to take it forward for the next generation. And how do you communicate these origin stories and the process to your customers? Um, so actually, so you know, uh, I try to show as much of the process as possible. And I don't know if you're going to be able to see these, but uh, we have source cards and tags that we use on our pieces. So each tag, um, which is actually a whole other story, we work with a paper maker who does botanical dyes and is a kindred spirit of mine. And we make these custom tags. You'll see like the little fragments of the laces or the antique textiles. And then on the back, we have the entire story about the piece. Um, and I, I have like 
photos that I we can include as well if, if we're able to. Um, but then also for the natural dye, you'll see um, it'll say like variation of the natural dye is unique to the individual peas, and then botanical and earth color evolves with time. It's really part of its intrinsic beauty, and it's one of a kind by nature. So it's important to uh, discuss with your customers, um, you know, that it isn't that it is special. It really just emphasizing the specialness of the piece and all of the hands that went into the creation of the garment and its story, its collection, how it was made, where it was made, um, the natural dye color. We try to include it all as best as possible. I love that you're trying to include all aspects within the supply chain and also really also celebrating that first part in the supply chain, which is about the farming and the creation of the fiber itself and the importance of that piece in the supply chain and not just thinking about circularity or zero waste in the design process, but thinking about it further back with the supply chain. So I think that's a really important point to talk about in this conversation is the idea that when we do talk about circularity and zero waste, that we're not just speaking of it in the design process. It really goes to include the entire supply chain, which really brings us back to that initial creation or the farming component for natural dyes, whether they come from food waste or others, and also from the fiber itself. So I think that's a really important portion of your story and of the philosophy you're celebrating in thinking about it as a community that we're building. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that very much because really it is, like I said, about how the textile is made, uh, you know, thinking about all of those hands, like we, as a designer, like, you know, majoring in fashion design, like it is beyond just about uh, a good design. It's really fun knowing where your fabric came from. Like, um, that was something that when I was at FIT, I almost left fashion design because I was kind of discouraged. I mean, this was in 2012. Sustainability wasn't really like, you know, talked about the way it is now, but um, I just didn't like going and getting yards and yards of fabric from a fabric store. Like I wanted to know where that fabric came from. I wanted to know the story. I wanted to be a part of preserving that story. And there's just so many hands and elements um, throughout the supply chain beyond just making beautiful clothing that I think need to be celebrated. And it does really begin with the textile, whether, you know, it's a, um, you know, an organic textile um, that's grown or the animals that you work with or the farms and the mills and um, the natural dye process. Yes, it's, it's so multifaceted. <laughs> And me, can you tell us more about how you're sourcing your natural dyes or your food waste that you're dyeing with? Yeah, so I'm um, so our original natural dye process primarily was using um, botanicals, so um, discarded flowers that we'd rescue from florists. Um, I also foraged from our backyard. I mean, some of my first natural dye experiments was with our mulberry trees um, in our backyard. Um, but as we've grown and again, working with um, different communities and expanded um, our botanical colorways, as well as, you know, production and um, it like can no longer be just me, um, natural dyeing every piece, I've wanted to find new partners to create with. And one of those uh, partners that we work with um, is in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, they're Green Matters Natural Dye Company. Uh, it's a natural dye house uh, that focuses on, um, you know, small to larger scale production. Um, so we've been able to um, kind of scale up our production processes with them. Um, but uh, again, you know, it it I know they do collaborations uh, as well with like you know restaurants or things like that. Um, so. Really, you can save your own food waste. You can go to restaurants and have that conversation, discuss with them. I mean, there are, I think, so many am amazing places, especially in the city in New York. Um, you know, that avocado for one is like one of the, the most widely eaten um, things, but they make a beautiful, beautiful color. I mean, start those conversations uh, with your community, um, you know, florists. Um, they do have a lot of waste um, and I know that most of the ones that I speak with are very happy to 
um, past that waste, which again is not really waste if you think about it beyond that, um, into something that really comes full circle. I mean, again, it's really that community and collaboration and finding partnerships and having that conversation. You know, people don't realize that um, food waste or or botanical waste or just waste in general can you know make really beautiful pieces. And I, in a lot of ways, I don't really think of it as waste. It's more like the next step in its journey and how we can make that come full circle into a way that um, really lasts forever. And I mean, that's part of what I really love about using botanicals is, you know, I love, you know, fresh flowers. I love outside. I love spring, you know, all those wonderful, beautiful things of nature. Um, gardening, you know, it's such a healing and meditative process. You can transfer that into um, the the botanicals or um, even bark or mud dyes or however you want to create, you can make pigments. I mean, this is just even beyond clothing. You can do uh, paints from natural dyes. You can do so many things that you can create pigments naturally and back, you know, uh, historically through time, you know, that's, that's what people did before, <laughs> before the mass, uh, the mass world took over. <laughs> That's true. I love how you talk about rescuing flowers and giving them a new life. That's wonderful. It it also really contributes to how much emotion you imbue in your designs, right? And where they get a value that is beyond the garment itself and the meaning and the the, the wider connection is in there. Thank you. Yeah, it's like for me, um, I don't want to create things that necessarily already exist or that, you know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy on so many different levels to create, um, whether you're doing it sustainably or not sustainably, um, you know, it's still a lot of energy. So for me, it's not worthwhile to do it unless it's really impacting the people and the planet and those that we're working with, because we have just so much in our world. And um, I really, really think it's important to think mindfully and ethically and in every way that you create even beyond clothing mm -hmm. and i uh, have a working when you started working with natural dyes has that changed your work your process as a fashion designer and if so how um so for me like even when i again was at fit um I actually had a bad experience with chemical dye <laughs> from from something we 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 we're, we had to dye to match pieces, and um, this very harsh chemical dye was recommended to us, and um, it like seeped through when I, when we discarded it, seeped through everything, and I was like, that is the end. I'm never ever touching chemical dyes again. So it was kind of like embedded in me, and that's when I started exploring natural dyes. Really. Um, you know, it started through tea dyeing and very, like I said, the mulberries and all of those things. And I've really expanded it over the last decade. Um, so, yes, it definitely um, is a core of our brand. Like, um, we don't use anything but natural color. And that's very important to me. And what I try to do is also painterly color. So it's not just, um, you know, your solid colors, although even those are so beautiful and have such depth to them. Uh, if you, you know, see the difference between natural color and um, not natural color, you'll see that the colors really are alive. Um, so, so yeah, so each season, like I had mentioned, um, we explore new natural color, new techniques, new ways that we can um, share our story and make things add, add to our botanical palette um, and explore that. Uh, so I hope that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, great. And then coming from your experience and you're scaling up your company now what are your where do you see the limitations on opportunities of scaling up natural dyes yeah i think at the end of the day you know it's really interesting because when i first started what i do you know especially integrating antique textiles or natural dyeing i never thought that i would um be working with like larger retail stores. Um, I never thought that would be an experience necessarily. Again, going back to like, you know, almost 10 years ago, like this really wasn't talked about. Buyers weren't looking for um, things that 
it's not that it's not consistent, but had a special, a special aspect to it in the store. You know, it was uh, back in the day. I feel like it was very much like everything had to be, you know, exactly the same. Natural dyes cannot be like that. Um, so I think uh, you have to have a discussion with your retailers if you're selling wholesale, uh, your customers directly. Again, it's about education. Um, we really, really need to re-educate the consumer um, as to how these these colors are alive. They will take on new lives. You know that is its uniqueness to it and its specialness to it. It's not a defect. Um, so making that very clear uh, in your marketing or um, in like with the tags, the communication, how how you how you have that, and then of course um, you know there is like you know a science <laughs> behind um, actually creating. It's not it's not just you know let's let's create and see what happens. Like there does have to be a certain um, range. Um, so. You can't just like sell something and then deliver a completely different color like that's not going to work. But again, like for us um, and with our partners that we work with, you know, uh, the water that we use is only rainwater from a cistern. So the pH levels and all of those things, it can vary the dye stuff. If we're using like um, reclaimed dye stuff, you know, whether it's discarded flowers or food waste or anything like that. Um, plants, they're not going to produce the same exact color in each lot. And um, so, you know, from sampling to production, you do have a variation um, even even from, like, you know, lot to lot. And again, it's about communicating that, um, having that be an open conversation, explaining that clearly, making sure you're, if you are, you know, selling to a store that your store understands that and can communicate that to their customer because you're not always going to be there to talk about it, having as much information as you can about it. Um, and uh, also um, educating them about wash care. So like our labels, I mean, I think wash care is really important conversation to talk about. Um, our labels specifically say to use a pH neutral gentle detergent um, to hand wash on cold um, or, you know, you can put it through the machine. But again, cold, you're not going to want to uh, use like a tide, for example, <laughs> necessarily because um, Tide is like made to remove stains. You know, you, you you get like these stain things, and and natural color, it's it's the pH, and and you can talk about that a lot better, I think, in detail than I can. But um, just to touch the surface, like it's really important to share the wash care um, explicitly, and even like when we're doing the indigo, um, you know, sharing with uh, the stores or the retailers that. Um, to make sure the way that you display it, if you're going to display it in a window, you know, because the lights will change different aspects of of the botanicals. And for me, like, I'm very, like, I love, love natural color. So I love the whole transformation it has, but you're not going to want, like, if you're, if you have a, a garment on display, like indigo half and half, you know, it's going to, it's going to turn, turn funny ways. Um, so again, it's just about re-educating, caring for your garment, knowing how to care for your garment and making sure that longevity is there. And then, um, I mean, to just touch a little bit more on, on that, um, in our processes with the botanical color that we use, because we do sell um, to consumers or to retailers, you have to also make sure what what products, like what botanicals you're using. So um, there's, you know, some of them, are not as light fast or they're more, you know, they're not going to last They're fugitive. They don't have that longevity. So it's educating yourself on what is possible to use to achieve that color. Um, because not all not all plant matter um, will actually stay on your garment. And then um, if we're going to go really in depth, the mordanting process is also critical uh, to uh, keeping long lasting color on your garments. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love how much you educate the wider public about the complexities of textiles and dyes and the interplay of all these factors in there. I think it really helps with fostering an appreciation of the process on the product. 
Yeah. Yeah, I would have to agree that with that. And as a chemist, I love hearing about you both speak about these intersectional points where we really see the intersection of truly science intersecting with this because you've just touched on many key principles both in chemistry itself, but also in color science and how we both study and characterize that. I mean, those are all key concepts that I would have taught in both of those courses. So that's really great. I was left wanting maybe both of you to talk a little bit about how somebody who heard this and says, wow, this seems like it should be accessible to me to try and explore and ex figure it out. How did you, can you explain a little bit more in detail about that process of exploration and how you in the end taught yourself what makes what colors, how we can do the actual process of natural dyeing, because it's a real stretch for somebody who's been so prescribed to say, well, you know, I'm going to take this out of this box and I'm going to get red. So, yeah, can you talk about that? Or to get even like <laughs> just in general, but it's possible with a lot of work and it is really beautiful. Um, so I think like, I mean, FIT has incredible programs uh, that you can learn um, the science behind. Cause I just think it's that we're, we're going to go into the science. Like I'm not a scientist, but I've learned so much um, about, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it is that intersection of science and art, which is very exciting to me. Um, so, you know, FIT has wonderful programs. If you're not at FIT, um, you, there, there really is so much knowledge out there now. Um, but one, one place I really always recommend uh, for dye explorations, um, botanical colors. Uh, they have wonderful dye stuff that you can buy. Um, just beginning, they have recipes and um, processes, and they have wonderful things like that that you can um, start exploring. Uh, but also just you know experimenting. Um, wearing what you make and seeing how it washes and lasts, uh, really, uh, it is, you know, about educating yourself, um, through multiple areas as, as you can and exploring that. I mean, I'm still, still learning and I, I always find natural color so exciting because it's alive and it's living and you're, there's an endless amount of, of knowledge that you can gain. Yeah, I, I agree. And. In the last, I want to say, 10 years before that, too, but we saw a, a number of new books coming out that are really working with natural dyes on different levels on a very introductory do yourself at your kitchen at home and then at a level also that is more in depth and explains to the chemistry behind it. And what the lovely thing about working with natural dyes is you can start off on a very, there's a very low threshold um, to cross working with just tea dyeing, for example, or coffee grounds or onion skins. And I think for somebody who's really interested in it, that naturally the progression would be to learn more and to get more complex by, for example, working with Mordens. And of course, at some point you get to the point where you, you really have to understand what's happening here and that there can even when we talk about natural dyes, that there can be levels of toxicity involved in there. And you, you want to make sure your process and your precautions are correct and that you're not using a pot that you use for cooking, for working with your mordants. So it's it can start off very simple. It can get very complex. And it, I think everybody just have to remember chemistry is everywhere. It's not like natural dyes are not chemistry. They are. Absolutely. The chemist in the room loves to hear that, Suzanne. Thank you. It's true. <laughs> and, and, you know, realizing that complexity and then some of the points you touched on, Mimi, like how do, how do we increase the light fastness of color or shift uh, the hues? And there, there you enter the realm of becoming an expert and really understanding the complexity and what the process behind it is. Yeah, no, it's so important. Um, the especially not mixing your food, <laughs> the things that you consume with your, and then um, yeah, so it that is so very important. And then like you said, um, you can get different color palettes from. 
the same dye stuff with your different mordants or even the pots that you use if you're using like a copper pot versus you know a, a stainless steel pot or, or things like that so um yes that is that is very important to think so Mimi, you you touched you already shared a lot of advice i'm just wondering is there any advice you want to share with new designers that are inspired by your work um i think it's like really important to uh really like i said before do your kind of do your research um as much as you can investigate um your sources and what you're looking to achieve um and just something uh if we're going to talk about like antique textiles since it is becoming more prevalent um now i think it's also important to be mindful of how you're using these pieces and making sure you're not if you are using uh antique textiles not using necessarily uh pieces that um still function as their intended use uh because i have a i have a big fear and i know i've said this i've said this a few times over the last few months but um as it be does become uh more popular um i think we need to educate ourselves about the history of the textiles and make sure that we're not um using any pieces that really should be at the museum, for example, you know, as its original intended purpose. Um, so, so really, it's just, you know, uh, getting involved as much as you can on all of the different paths. And it's not just um, design, really, it's, it's textiles, science, uh, um, history, uh, everything. Um, and that kind of concept, if you are looking to um, be more mindful in the way that you create. I think it's so important to talk about the mindfulness and creation and understanding all of the steps within the process. Um, really from the very beginning and that very raw component and trans that transformative power that we've really been discussing. Because I think a lot of you, if you really step back and look at our conversation today, it looks at how we're transforming things and also the intersectional points and all of the points that matter along the way, which I think is a really exciting component of this as well. Um, I would love to hear just a touch before, Suzanne may have a few other thoughts or questions, but how, to, from a practicing designer, a true creator, um, a studier, explorer, a scholar of textiles and dyeing, how does it feel to now have your work be shown? Um, it's shown at the museum at FIT as part of the permanent collection. You now have the exhibit um, at the Met. You've had your garments worn by very mindful consumers on very large stages. How? How do you help feel that that really helps contribute to the voice of change and power for sustainability and true study of, I'm going to call it artisanal craft within um, fashion and design? Well, I mean, like I said in the beginning, FIT is very uh, near and dear to my heart. I've had wonderful uh, collaborations with after, after graduating um, with the textile department. Um, I, some of the hand weaving that we've done, um, is with professor Nomi Kleinman, who is a dear friend of mine. Uh, we've worked, um, with, uh, president sustainability grant, um, for, uh, flax. Uh, so when, uh, professor Silberman, who has since retired, um, he, uh, grew the flax and we did a wonderful project with the, um, New England flax and linen group and then made handmade lace and made a jacket. So, I mean, it goes beyond. And then of course, uh, the museum at FIT, which is one of my favorite museums and, um, dear friends as well. Um, now after graduation, I've gotten the pleasure and honor, um, to work closely with Colleen Hill, um, who did the exhibit fashion unraveled where, uh, 1 of our botanically dyed corset gowns were in and is now part of the permanent collection at FIT. Um, I mean, for me, the Met, uh, it's so beyond just like having my work there, um, my relationship and appreciation for um, 
conservation and preservation and curators in museum uh, fields is um, just very deep. I mean, I, I did my internship um, at museums. So, <laughs> so museums are very important to me. Um, most of my mentors are from the museum world. Um, Phyllis Magidson from the Museum of the City of New York really was the first one um, who saw my collection um, at my thesis in FIT. And actually that was our first museum experience that we had. Um, they did an exhibit called Made in New York um, back at the South Street Seaport Museum uh, with the Museum of the City of New York and our thesis collection was on view. So it's 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 a very like close relationship that I have. Um, but the Met obviously like I words cannot express. I mean, that's just so many layers of a dream to me. Um, as far as seeing your work, um, you know, in, in these ways, I think, I mean, obviously, like, it's very, I feel very appreciative that people appreciate it. Um, and I've always said, like, for me, it's, again, um, at the end of the day, like, I think the idea of sustainability and mindfulness and all of these things are what we should be having in the industry. Like it shouldn't be a discussion. So I've always said from the beginning, it's like peeling back different layers. So you see a garment, you resonate with a garment. At the end of the day, like the consumer is still going to, or whoever's wearing it or, or admiring it is going to appreciate it on a visual level. And I think it's important then to have those layers of that conversation so it becomes more meaningful and you can really understand all of those aspects that go into into making because like i i said in the beginning like it's whether or not you're doing things uh sustainably or not sustainably there's still so much energy there's still the hands that make it like it doesn't stop so we need to do it in a mindful way for for our future generations for for the industry for it shouldn't even in my opinion be a conversation of a different section if that makes sense <laughs> Makes sense perfectly. Suzanne, some other thoughts you might like to add here. Well, I think Mimi just wrapped it up perfectly with this statement. I think it's really, you know, and one of my questions would have been, how do you see yourself changing or impacting the fashion industry? And I think you just outlined that really well. Thanks. Yeah, I just, I'm so, I, I feel so strongly about the hands that make these things that are involved from from the the farm to the fiber to the final garment um and it being done in a way that respects respects the work of all the individuals because at the end of the day however you're creating people are actually making it and we need to respect that yeah we we do in the artists and the industry often see this distinction between a designer and an artisan and a craftsperson. And I think that's something really important you just said there to not make this what is sometimes really a very artificial distinction and more about a hierarchy than the work that is done, that you're actively working to break that down and involve everybody in this process and give them the a, a voice as well and the and show what their work has contributed to the overall project. Yeah, and I think it's important for for those, you know, we all wear clothes for us to understand where they came from and again, you know, re-educating that consumer um the value of of clothing um it's a very long hard road that we have ahead of us um you know big change starts small and i think it's so wonderful to see so many small companies and designers and just the next generation really grasping onto this so i really have hope for our future um that this will no longer be just a general topic of conversation, like a, a very close topic of conversation. It's not, you know, it's, it just is, it'll be the way we work um, in the future. I will second that and I will take it from here and say, I think the points that you're both bringing up and sharing are this 
it is very true that small changes in the end by a large group of people end up having large impact. And so I think every small change we make in terms of how we break silos, how we start communicating, how we collaborate, how we look at things from an in intersectional perspective at all different levels really in the end gives us this great opportunity to change the impact um, of things that, yes, we must every day. I'm pretty sure everybody wants me to wear clothes to work every day. So we all need clothes every day. So I think we're not gonna stop needing clothes. We're never gonna totally stop being a consumer of clothing or textiles in that way, especially here in the Northeast. So I think how we make them and what those are is really impactful. And it's a place where um, designers can have a great impact. Um, but so can the consumer by choosing to invest in those pieces and to support the work um, by people who are really committing to their own core values as it relates to sustainability in that space. Um, and so it is my great pleasure to thank both of you for spending time this afternoon and sharing your work, sharing your experience um, with natural dyeing and creation of textiles and garments and really transforming how we consider the pillars of sustainability within color as it connects to fashion and design in this space. So again, thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon, Mimi and Suzanne, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and I will endlessly learn from FIT and it's such a pleasure to learn from the both of you and I really look forward to seeing the rest of the conference as well as um, what everybody's doing at FIT. It's really exciting and thank you for always including me.